Hi, I'm Steve Waters, and I love playing roto sound strings, whether they're flat round or round round. Hi, my name is Evander Swaby. Um, I love playing roto sound strings, and I play the jazz flat wound strings. 2008, I think I actually joined, or well, they came to me, 2002, where I met Jason. And to this day, they do the best flat wound strings in the world. In the world, bar none. Bar none. I first went to college in America because I had a basketball scholarship in New York. Um, so I went over in 82 and played at New York Institute of Technology. And then um, for one thing, to, make, to cut a long story short, um, I formed a band in college in my junior year, which is the third year of college. It was a four year course and we uh, entered talent shows, three of them, and we won them all. And I went, you know what? I'd want to be a robot designer, which is what I was doing, industrial engineering. Um, looking back at it, it might have been pretty good. Um, I don't want to be a jock, because I was in a basketball scholarship. I want to play bass. This is great. So I went back home to London. I practiced um, for two years, 14 hours a day. And then got my first, this was um, Christmas 84. And then in about September, August, September of 86, during this two years of shedding, I got a call, I was gonna to go to the Falklands. I went to the Falklands, did a combined service at that entertainment tour with 12 gigs in the Falklands, two in the Ascension Islands and the equator. And I used that money to go back to New York to go, hi, because my grandmother was living there and I was kind of half staying with her and my father was over there. And um, on that journey, in the, in the October, I went, I'm going to go down to um, West 14th Street and go and play basketball in the outdoor court outside the village underground. So I was playing away. And someone said, oh, we're winning 11-8. It was up to 15. And someone said, uh, what's up, Jack? And there's this big chicken wire fence about 20 feet tall. And the guy's looking through the chicken wire fence with a black berry on, mm. white T-shirt, black jacket, jeans, Converse shoes, sky blue. And I went, that's Jack Opastorius. Anyway, we continued playing. We lost 15-8. I kind of fell apart. So he came in and um, I said, what's up, Jack? He said, hey, how's it going? I said, look, can I get, can you put me D on your team? Put me D is, can you put me down on your team? I was back, I was in the lingo back then. <sighs> so, um, and he says, yeah, man, you're a cool cat. You're a cool cat. So we played for like three and a half hours. I bought some beers and we sat and we talked at the end of that three and a half hours and I said, uh, do you give bass lessons? And he went, yeah, sure. So this was a Friday. So I said, uh, what about Monday? He went, no, Monday's not good. What about Tuesday? Yeah. Um, what time? Come over about half 10. Great. Gave me his address. Tuesday turned up. I turned up at his place and knocked on the door and he opened the door and his eyes were all bleary, he'd just woken up. Oh man, I forgot. And I said, look, don't worry, I'll just go and get some beers. He went, yeah, great idea. Went off, got some beers, came back. And it was $20 an hour. So three and a half hours went by. And I'm like, I've got $38. Shit. I said, I'll tell you what, you know what I'm going to do? Um, I said in my head, I'm going to invite you over for dinner. But then the doorbell rang, and that's when he taught me that. Um, yeah. 
So, um, and I was playing that beat up bass, the Fender, and he had a sky blue one. And, um, and he was playing that Fender bass and I was up, I'm going, I'm playing the bass and he's showing me come on, come over and mm -hmm. Portrait Tracy and all those great tunes, Havana and um, uh, Birdland. Wow. And, and I was playing everything kind of half speed to him because I'm like, I'm just soaking it all in. So anyway, the doorbell rang and he said, oh man, that's my girlfriend, I, um, I've got a... I've got to stop now. So I said, uh, how much do I owe you? And he said, oh man, you're a cool cat. Just paid my girlfriend's taxi fare. So I'm like, okay. So I'm not to pack away because I used his bases, I had like a little bag with me. And then I went down the stairs to the street. It was on like 42nd street, no, 34th street. And the yellow cab was at the end. And then the girlfriend ran up the stairs and gave, they, they hugged at the top and kissed and the door closed and I took a big swallow and I looked in the window and I said, um, I'm paying the taxi, how much is it? He said, uh, four dollars please. So three and a half hour lesson with Jacko for four dollars and four beers. Bargain. Yeah, <laughs> bargain. Bargain. Yeah. You won. Yeah. But he spurred me on because I said, oh, just before I left, I said, uh, is there anything I really need to learn? And he says, no, man, just keep going as you're going. I said, what's your name again? I said, Steve Waters. He said, I'm going to look out for that name. And I went, right. I've got something to prove here. Yeah. So. That's amazing. to practice different ways of muting. Yeah. I try to make things as like musical always as I can because I find someone like me I couldn't just someone says I'll oh, just I need to understand the yeah the musicality behind of course, it. You have, to, you have to feel it. I've got to feel yeah. it. If I can't yeah. feel it I can't and I completely understand that because when I first started playing um I was, I was 15 and my dad bought me a guitar, but I only played on the bottom four strings. Yeah. And I thought, I'm a bass player. Yeah. So then I got a, a bass, but he made me a bass amp. And I would start practicing some point during the day. Yeah. And it was during the winter when I got it. So I was playing and playing and playing, and I wouldn't even stop to go to the loo, I wouldn't stop to eat. Yeah. And it would get dark. Mm. And as it got darker and darker, I wouldn't even stop to put the lights on. Okay. So you'd have to listen. And then uh, there was a mirror in front of me, so I would be standing and looking at my finger technique to making sure my fingers weren't flying away. Mm. And then it dawned on me that whatever I played when I was amplified, someone was listening. So you must always practice as if you're performing. And I internalized that, so whenever I play, I want it to have a groove. Mm. I want it to feel right and have that musicality that you're, yeah. that you're talking of because without that, it's not music. Yeah, it's not. And you're not developing if you can't make one note or two notes or three notes sound musical. Yeah. So, I think because coming from coming from a church background, yeah. as I do, I think you know you're kind of just thrown in yeah. the deep end, and it's like on a Sunday morning, they don't care. Yeah. Any song can change at any time. Yeah. The key can change even midway in the song mm. and you've just got to be able to feel it and go along with it. Yeah. So it's, I've kind of adopted that kind of approach. Mm. But now growing up and getting into more into the professional arena, mm. I know that now I, can't, I can use those skills. Yes. But those skills can either make me or break me if I don't adapt them properly exactly. and use um, the current skills that someone like yourself would have. Yeah and adopt those skills so yeah. I think it's just important to learn it all instead of just learning one exactly. aspect. Exactly, exactly. Um, when I first started off there was a really good club scene in London, late 80s, early 90s and there was a place called Singers where 
there'd be a house band and I was in that house band and then people would, it was like a thousand people would come in and be seated at tables and table service and things. Yeah. And if Michael Jackson was in town, the band would come in and go, yeah, they get up and play. So there'd be Prince's band, Michael Jackson's band, Chaka Khan's band, wow. whoever's band was in town, they would be getting up and playing. Wow. So it was like, gosh, you've got to be on. I've got, I've got to play, I've got to play. Mm. So, and you learn, and I was doing all my chops and playing and everything. But then when I got to songwriters, it was people's original songs. So we had to learn the original songs. And in that house band was a drummer called Dylan Howe, mm. the son of Steve Howe. And he is an amazing jazz drummer now, um, Dylan. But he always had a lovely groove. And in fact, we were learning some tunes we would get in on, on Monday around one and we'd learn it until we'd rehearse with the artist until about six or seven. Doors would open at eight and then off we go. So I'd just written out some sketches yeah. of what the parts were. And we were playing and Dylan put down his drum and some drumsticks and went, What are you doing? Wow. You're not playing what's on the record. There's a there's a two four bar there and it goes da 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 and you, you keep, you never get it. Why aren't you getting it? He said, look, I've written the stuff out. Mm. From that day, I went home and went, right, I'm writing, listen to every single bar from beginning to end, and I'm gonna write it out as close as I can. Yeah. From that day, I went, I'm never, ever gonna be. Um, that was a, a, a great lesson. I'm never gonna be the one that can't play the part, which is wow. difficult. Yeah. So Dylan, thank you so much. He taught me a massive lesson. But there was another guy there called um, Alan Darby, who's a guitarist for um, Bonnie Ray, um, Eric Clapton, um, Natalie Imbruglia, mm. those kind of people. Wow. Bonnie Tyler as well. And I just come out of just like, and he's got just play the song. And I'm like, no, but if you do this and... No, no, just play, play the, song. the song. So... Alright, so you can put a few little licks like that in, but just play the song. And he would stop playing if I went off somewhere. Mm. So I'm like, okay. So Dylan said, taught me, write out the parts and do the artist justice. Yeah. Alan said, play the song. Yeah. Don't play Steve Waters, it's not the Steve Waters album. Yeah. Play, play the artist. From that point I went, okay, that's what I'm going to learn how to do and I put the jazz stuff down. Mm. And Dylan said, I'm going to be a jazz drummer, I'm going to be a jazz drummer. So I went, great, you carry on. But when I concentrated on that, I started to get gigs from people that were coming into the, um, into the clubs and going, oh, I like that guy's groove. I like the way he plays. And he's playing the song and it feels nice. I'll get called away on tours and oh, do you want to come into the studio and do this? Mm. And we were in, there was a, a guy called Lewis Taylor. He was signed to um, Island Records and he was like a little prince. And he came in and his stuff was funky like anything. Anything. It was like Graham Central Station. Wow. Mixed in with Bootsy Collins, but vocals like um, the Beach Boys. That real funk. Real funk. And then, but also he had quirkiness like Chick Corea or craft work, and I'm like, where's all this music coming from? Mm. And then he said, well, actually, most of it comes from the old blues guys, Sunhouse, Blind Lemon Jefferson, and Robert Johnson. Mm. So if you listen to those guys, most of the guitar playing that I do comes from there, mm. but the, the way that they sing, I also take that on, because it comes from the heart, and there's a, there's a certain technique that they use. And he said even Louis Armstrong sings in that way. 
but it's a singing technique. Yeah. And those guys had that smile, but it was a singing technique to get the the shape of the noise right. And it, mm. I was like, you're going into details like I've never seen before. So working with him, it started with an eight piece band, including him, and then it went down to seven, it went down to six, six. and it went down to a five, and then a four, and a three piece, Trio. drums, bass, and guitar. Then it went down to two piece, and it was just me and him. And I'm like, and I looked around after a year and went, how come it's just you and me? He says, you're the only one that plays with the groove. I said, but I don't have all that, so I don't need all that. I just want, to, want you to play the song, and if I show you something, you can play it. Mm. If I expose you to something, you can play it. And that came back to me 2008. We were playing George Michael in, in America, doing an American tour. And Niall, who is his studio engineer, co-producer, programmer, said to me, um, he said, oh, well, you played really well last, or tonight. You played really well tonight, it was great. But you missed out one note in one of the songs twice and I said yeah I was getting carried away a little bit and I got distracted and I couldn't remember what that note was so I left it out and then played the next note and because because to make it sound intentional the second time it came round I left it out again wow okay and he went yeah yeah but you left out those two notes so he said look you're doing doing really well Steve it sounds great he said you know the one thing that that George loves about you and I said what's that he said it's not like you're an amazing accomplished bass player but if he exposes you to that music he knows that you can play it I think that's an art that's lost yeah that's a real art that's lost today you know people being exposed to different things yeah I think everyone's trapped and just learning one particular kind You've of music. You've got to go back in history yeah. and have a look at who started what yeah. and what they brought forward yeah. and then involve that in your playing. Yeah. Understand where it comes from, why it was so successful, why people like it. He took me back, uh, Lewis Taylor took me back from the congressional tapes which were recorded in 1930s and 40s mm. and the only place that had electricity was at the train stations. So that's why all of them are recorded there, and sometimes you can hear the trains going to by. So I didn't even, this is why, and sometimes you can hear the horses in the background because they took their mules and their horses to get them to the station. Wow. So RCA could record what they were doing. Yeah. Because I think for me, like, the furthest I've gone back is James Jameson. That Motown. That's fantastic. Yeah, got to go back to that mode house and yeah. then you, you adventure into Willie Weeks. Yes. Who um, played on some great records. Yes. And then you, you venture forward and you get your Marcus Millers, your yes. Stanley Clarks, your Victor yeah. Wootons, who took that sound to a different level. Yeah. That real funk kind of vibe. Yeah. Louis Johnson. Louis Johnson. Larry Graham. Larry, Larry Graham, yeah. all those kind of bass players. And then you take it a bit forward, a bit more yeah. than you get someone like Pino Palladino. Yes who is kind of amalgamated all those kind yes. of sounds, yes. which has allowed him to play in every genre. Exactly. There's not one genre I haven't seen Pino play in. And I've never ever heard him overplay once. And everything he does is just meticulous. It's brilliant. And it sounds right, it's warm. Yeah. You know, when he's playing for D'Angelo, it's warm, it's funky. He's the heart of the band. Yeah, and then he goes and plays for John Mayer, which yeah. is like a kind of a rock kind yeah. of vibe. And he does that. And he played for The Who when the John Who. Whistle, late John Entwistle, who was a rotor sound player, died. He Pino in. came and stepped in and went, right, I can do rotor sound. Yeah, and he did it. And then you virtue a bit forward and then you go to people like Sheree Reed. Yes. Those kind of players, Rocco Palladino, yeah. Jerry Grant, yeah. Lindsley Campbell, yeah. yourself, you know. And then you go a bit further more and you've got guys like myself. Mm -hmm. Levi Yardi, yeah. Dana Fisher, mm -hmm. you know, so it's, it's everyone, we're all coming from somewhere. Yes. But I think it's just so important for, especially young aspiring bass players, make sure you go back into the history yeah. and learn 
everything that you can learn so that you can amalgamate it into what you do. Of that's course. something that I've done, which has allowed me to be um, successful in moving forward. Yeah. And um, so, yeah, it's, 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 that's what I think you have to do. Yeah, it's important. The importance of playing music is not just what you play, it's what you don't play. Mm -hmm. um, when I first started with George in 96, the percussion player, Danny Cummings, came up to me and he says, welcome to Bernstein, it's great to see you, you know, it's mm. nice, we'll have a great time with this. And I said, yeah, great, I'm really pleased to be on board. And he said, uh, we're having a break and we were having a coffee break. What we'd normally do, we'd rehearse from say 10 in the morning until about half one, have a break, have some lunch, Re resume maybe at 2.30, maybe 3, mm -hmm. and then we'll go up until about 6, and then we'll have another break for dinner, and then we'll come in about 7, mm -hmm. and George will come in at half 7, 8 o'clock. Now, in one of those breaks he said, look, there's 15 people in this room, plus all the crew. The art of playing not just George's music, any music at all, is to be invisible. I'm yeah. Like, what do you mean? He said, well, play, but play and observe as if you're listening to the record. We've all got great mixes, mm -hmm. so get your mix so it sounds like a record, mm -hmm. and just play as if you are listening to the record, record. but your fingers just happen to That's be moving. That's one of the first things you told me, you know. Fingers just happen to be moving. And there's no ego, so you don't want no feels or anything, just stick to what the song is. Yeah. And when you start doing that, the song gets bigger. Mm. So I went, okay. I tried it and I went, took a couple of hours to kind of adjust my ears. Yeah. When George came in that evening and sang, I almost dropped off my seat. Wow. Because suddenly the song was like this. Mm. It was like an orchestra, but also I could hear where he was phrasing opposed to where he, the album version of his vocals were phrased. Yeah. He was like, I don't feel it that way anymore. I feel it like this. So he went, okay, I've got to move myself slightly because the guitar moves slightly, the percussion moves slightly, the keyboards have moved slightly. So you move with it. Yeah. So it's always liquid. It's always moving and there's a creativity within that which makes the music really happen. Yeah. And when you take yourself out of the equation, e egoistically, suddenly you find the music lives like that. It lives like a liquid, mm. like, a, like a galaxy in space or a nebula or something. It just explodes and you're like, whoa. Yeah, yeah. It's, I think it's the same kind of thing with um, Mansell Brown. I think you know when I got the call to do that, and he called me. He said, "Evan, if you come, you know, I'm putting a trio band together. Mm. Um, this is my new album, and I need you to learn these songs. Mm. And coming to the rehearsal next week, I came in, I learned the songs, and you know, I kind of, do you know, when you kind of just like you were talking about." You kind of just went and overplayed. You made yourself yeah. Yeah. like you are the main guy. Yeah, I'm here. I'm here now. Yeah. You know, I can, do, I can do it all. Yeah. I can play. And I remember he took me aside and said, Evander, I know you can play, but can you just tone it down a little bit? Because my guitar needs to sing mm. and we're clashing. Mm. Can you just be the heartbeat? Yeah. So I stripped it back and I found more enjoyment just playing the line. Mm instead of playing the line and trying to play something else to try and compete with him. Exactly. And it's interesting you're saying have his guitar sings. When you make yourself invisible, you then develop a voice of your own. Yeah. Because what you're playing then becomes a voice and it sings. Yeah. And that's when, when everything is singing, that's when the music is happening. Music it's happens. not only the singer that sings, we all sing. We all see it as a, as a group, and I think yeah. right. you know when we um, when we finished that rehearsal mm. in the end, and he came to me after, and his management team came to me afterwards. They said, "You know what? We like you. Mm. 
because you've got such a groove and mm. you've got, you, you really feel the music mm. and that's something that I pride myself on yeah. is just making sure that I groove mm -hmm. and I feel the music mm. because if every, if I can feel the music that means you can feel the music exactly which means you're going to two-step you're going to bop your head yeah. you're going to lift your hands mm -hmm. you're going to do whatever you've got to do yeah. to to interact with what we are doing as a group yeah. so I think that was such an important lesson and that was in 2000, 2019 mm. that was um, when I got that call yeah. and from then that's kind of what's helped shape me yeah. and mould me and being around guys like yourself, Luke Smith, mm. Lindsley Campbell, all you great musicians have moulded me into what I am today. So, But you've moulded you, all we've done is added some more clay. Mm. And Go, well, look, we're going to put that bit of clay on and you mould yourself. Mm. No one can mould you. They can throw clay at you. Yeah. It depends how, what sticks. Um. What kind of things are you kind of practicing at the moment and what are you working on? I'm actually learning one of Luke Smith's tunes. It's um, called Going Home. Um, he put me on the spot a couple of weeks ago, as you know. Yeah. And said so he put the music in front of me, Steve, you're a reader. Yeah, run bars in the room. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> so I kind of tripped my way through it and then he said, look, I'll send you the, the track. And he sent me the, the music. And what I did, I put it into Amazing Slow Downer. Okay. And I put it to three quarters of the tempo to make sure that I could get all of the tricky rhythmic things. In intricacies and stuff. And so I could feel it. So when I slowed it down, I went, well, okay. So then 75% one day, but the next day, let's try 85%. The next day, let's try 95%. And I was feeling it so much that when I was going to bed, my wife was, uh, was going, are you tapping? And I'm like, yeah, I'm tapping. It's kind of keeping me, it's yeah. waking me up. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, I won't tap anymore. So I thought, I'll tell you what I'll do, I'll silently hum. So I was going, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then in the morning she said, um, thanks for stopping tapping, but I could hear you humming. Oh gosh. <laughs> But it's because yeah. I wanted to get my get into my consciousness as I was going to sleep, so therefore it would take me in my sleep, and I could wake up and go, "Got it." Mm. Um, so I'm now at like I'm, I'm up to 100%, and I have the rhythms and they're inside of me. But that's that's how I approach it. Is that how you learn music in general? Yeah, I like to get into it. I like to really understand it and if if something it trips me up then well, I call it a bridge so I look at it as a bridge like this and mm -hmm. I go I have to flatten that bridge yeah and flatten it and flatten it until it doesn't become an obstacle and it's not a bridge it's the road so I work I spend my time on the bridges and I flatten them out and then I keep going, keep going, and if there's another bridge, I go, right, I'm gonna work that one, flatten that out, and I go from beginning to end, and work on the joints between where the bridges used to be, and then play the song from beginning to end, and I'll record myself, and if it, I've been known to record myself maybe 22 takes per song with a set list of 35 songs. Wow just to make sure there are no bridges left. It's just pure motorway. I think, like, it's their attention to detail. It's also a fear. I don't want to be, I've never wanted to be the person from those two examples of 
Dylan saying, what are you doing? You didn't yeah. get that bar. And play the song. I don't want to be that person in rehearsal to have the finger pointed at going, Oi, mm. you're not doing your job. Mm. What I want to be is the person that understands the music and has it internalised. Yeah. And even though the music might be there on, a, on an iPad, and if someone else goes wrong or if something is going wrong, I have it internalised so much that I can go, well, hang on a minute, the timing of this is slight, could be this and maybe the voicing of this chord could be mm. and the voicing of the B BVs could be because you're not only internalising your own part, but you're internalising, you're internalising everything. how everything supports yeah. your part and how you're supporting them. And when you get into it that way, um, and you remove yourself from it so you can listen, then your ears open up so you can, why don't you try this? And why don't you try that? And possibly it could go like this. Mm. And that's where working with different artists and different musicians also comes into different characters because you have to understand how certain people think, what their egos could, yeah. could be tripped on or yeah. sparked. You could spark mm. something. So again, you have to treat people like you treat the music. You have yeah. to step back mm. and make sure that when you are saying something, it's well said and diplomatic. Constructive criticism. Constru yeah. I was doing a recording session. Um, I can name the area. It was in Kent, near Rye, in Kent. And um, it was a... Uh, we were living in that area for three or four weeks while we were doing the album. So we would, uh, we did about four or five tunes and we did another tune and we did the first take and the artist said, I'm not sure about that, we did a second take. I think we could do better than that, did a third take. Then they stopped the session and said, you know what, there's something wrong with, you know what it is? Yeah. The bass doesn't sound black enough. And I was like, what? Yeah. So the artist then sat down and sang bar by bar the bass line that he wanted to hear. So I went, okay. So what is it? I'll play that. Great, lovely. Took two and a half hours. Mm -hmm. Played it back and went, no, it still doesn't sound right. So the engineer, who had loads of experience, so much experience that he was one of the engineers on uh, the Rainbow recording of Bob Marley on the Whalers at the Rainbow in London. Mm. And he went, um, hang on a minute. So let me play this. And he pressed play and he and the artist listened and went, That's it! That's the one! That's the one. And the engineer turned around and said, That was the first take. But I just had to sit there and just go, Alright. But without going, oh hang on a minute and Mm. No questioning, just, okay, this is the road you want to go down. Let's go down, let's explore it. But you explore it together with that, okay? Mm. I mean, there was a couple of other situations, but that was one of the most... Uh, one that highlights the Yeah, most. the highlights, the, the yeah. differences in between characters who want to show what they know and to show that they're the boss um, 
and you, you're there as a hired hand, essentially. But also you're there because they've picked you and they've chosen you to be there. Yeah. So, so therefore you should have the confidence in yourself to step so, back and let your music speak for itself. itself. That's, and that's an art in itself because um, there's been a couple of times when I've been questioned and, and for big occasions and the artist will question and say, I want to hear the CD from yesterday or the recording from yesterday. And then they play the recording from yesterday and you, and you say, so what would you like me to do? Would you like me to play what's on the recording of what I've just played? And they went, I suppose so. And dropped the song. And all you've got to do is go, okay. Because it's, you're, the, you're the boss, you're the captain of the ship. Of the ship, yeah. I'm, I'm part of the crew. So, whichever way it goes, you just have to not put yourself in the firing line. Yeah. But yet, at the same time, if you feel like you need to say something musically, mm -hmm. I'm playing, and then I'm playing the G. Say it, say it's like that. And so suddenly they go, well, hang on a minute, what's all that? Well, that's a, like a sharp five, which brings a little bit of tension. And because you're singing this note, which might be, um, it brings that, that chord. Mm, yeah, yeah. As you're singing tonic. Oh, okay. Yeah, I think I like it. But you, I will, I will answer for myself when it comes something like that, because it's a musical thing and you can, you can explain it mm. just as I gave it. We can give an example. Yeah. And then if they like the example, it's kept. If they don't like the example, they go, well, no, play this instead. But you're giving them a chance and an opportunity to through example. Yeah. That's the only time I would ever um, question an artist. Mm -hmm. But not question, but if they question me, I would give an answer give in, a, in a musical, musical way. way. So it's not offending them. No. Or it's kind of like, I'm respecting yes. your ship. These are exactly. But this is how I'm going to just nudge you. Maybe yeah. just slightly nudge you. Yeah. But and if you have this, it could work. It could work. Yeah. And then they make the decision from there. Exactly. Because at the end of the day, like you said, you're, you're hired. Exactly. So. Exactly. Yeah, it makes sense. No, I think 100% right. And also being a musician is... is very different from a lot of other professions. Most people go nine to five and they see the same people every day, but they leave and they go home. Mm. And even though we're not doing nine to five every day, a lot of times if you're in the studio, it's almost 24 seven, apart from when you go to bed. Yeah. And when you're on the road, it's almost the same thing too. Yeah. And you're living together, so it's a family. It's a real family thing. So the artist male would be, like a dad, yeah, and if it's female, it'll be like mum, and so therefore you have to almost have to treat them like that, yeah. And then within the crew, there are uncles and aunties and cousins and stuff because of their rank within yeah, the hierarchy, within the hierarchy, and also within um, within the band, there's a hierarchy because it would be an MD. Yeah, etc. So they'll be like an uncle or grandfather or whatever kind of figure yeah. who will go, well, no, this is how it goes. And so you have to also be aware of how you are and how you come across with people because you are living in this bubble. Yeah. Which we are all very used to now. Yeah. <laughs> well, the rest of the world is actually to learning how to, to live, live, in, live in, in that bubble. bubble. But, we, but we we're know. living in this bubble yeah. where you are always, that is part of your payment to be that person. Not just to get up on stage and do the sound check and to do the gig, gig. and to be 
whoever you are, your character is in the dressing room or the after show or whatever it is. Mm. But it's during all those other times, you are being paid to be a certain so, kind of person that can fit in to that, that family. That, that's fair, yeah. And not be an outcast. Yeah. Because there have been times when I've been asked to do drop-in gigs. Can you do, let's say we're doing this thing in New York, it's only one rehearsal. It's New York, we're going to do uh, the Conan O'Brien show, then we're going to do a gig at the Hammers Hammerstein Ballroom. Sure. When? And when to rehearsal? Oh, the day before the gig. Okay, can you send me the stuff? And you get sent the stuff. But it's because the person that I'm filling in for... Yeah. Wasn't had, acting. Had something yeah. which didn't quite agree. Um, which then opened the opportunity, which meant that they went, oh, we'll have you again. And it's happened to me maybe three or four times when this person, and can you drop in? And, and then being able to read because of learning through Dylan Howe. Thanks, Dylan, again. Um, then people go, well, because Steve can read. And I'm not a great sight reader, but once I have it, I will internalise it. You like, mean, yeah. yeah. The first thing is to get yourself acquainted with their music. Um, and once you get acquainted with their music, you then understand um, where they had their hits, which hits they are, um, what sound and era they come from. For example, like with Cliff Richard, he's started in the 50s, so he's had hits in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s and noughties. And each of those decades have a different sound because technology has moved on. Um, so therefore, not only are you looking for a sound, you're looking for a style. And there's a style from every decade as music advances and changes. Sometimes it doesn't advance. Some people might say the 80s was one where it all went backwards. Some might say the 90s is when it went backwards. But there's a different style for every decade. So therefore you have to then look at your equipment as in basses, strings, and amplification. So once you've picked your bass, the strings are next. So you want something that has a sound and has longevity, but also has um, flexibility. So. And then once you've found that, if you are looking for a specific sound, then I normally go, I sometimes go to this. It used to be a, a, a bigger pedal board, like a Line 6 thing. But I bought one of these. But it has two channels. So I set one channel to a bright and the other channel to a darker sound and the bright and when you press the button it sound it's either green or red so I put my darker sound on red and my brighter sound on green so I use that to help me then get a brighter or darker sound out of whatever I've chosen to use bass wise or string wise and then I go to technique whether you're playing here here or here or with the thumb, or with the fingers, or muting with the left hand, whichever way I then try and get that type of technique because of, depending on what uh, decade or sound was uh, prevalent at that particular time. So that's how I approach it. But first you have to get into the song and then once you've got into the song you have to learn how to play the song, then you have to apply the sound that you have to match the sound which is on the original 
but you'll also get tapes or recordings of how the previous bass player did it so you have to match in between you use that as a starting place and then you go well actually the they might have missed this bit or I think this bit should be in so you have to play around but the most important part is to play the song play it if there is a previous bass player to play it with that player in mind so your your starting position is where they left off and then you go right I I'm comfortable with it now I think I would put more emphasis on this note and then you wait and kind of go right that passed and then you go again and you go I'll put an emphasis here that passed and you keep going and you go, right, okay, I'm finished with that song. You do that with every single song. And so you develop it into your own, but keeping the original in mind and keeping what it used to be, the most recent, um, and also take, take into consideration that maybe even some of the other musicians are different. So that's when you're adding different phrases or emphasis on notes, because... You're, you're listening in your head and going, oh, the guitar does this on the tape, and it does this during the original, but this guitarist is doing this. So maybe you should support it without getting in the way. So that's how I approach different songs from different eras with different styles um, and different approaches. Um, I saw that you played with Amy Winehouse. She was an amazing woman. She went up to, she would come up to the band and say, right, in rehearsals, for the best performance today, I'm going to give a Mars bar. So I'm like, I don't really like Mars bars, but I really want that Mars bar. I really want it. So we're in rehearsals for two, three weeks. I'm like, I'm on. I'm getting this Mars bar. And again, using the same approach, I know how the song goes. I'll give it a little bit of a flavour here and step back and see if it passes. A little bit of a flavour here. And then the A and R people would come in and then people would what happens is people rehearse and you play it at one volume because you're practicing volume. But one thing which I've learned with George, um, is that you always have to play at show volume because if you're rehearsing at one volume as soon as you get to the show your adrenaline's going to kick in and everybody's going to play 5 to 10 dB louder and your whole in-ear mix is going to get messed up so everyone came in all the A&R people and others went right here's show volume but show, show intention rather than show volume and then because you're in it and you're comfortable, you've been playing all day and I'd go, right, and you'd do maybe a little run or something to go with the brass and she'd come over and go, Steve's won the Mars bar of the day. There you go, I go, thanks very much. I wouldn't even open it because I didn't really like Mars bars. <laughs> but that, she, she was great. But she would also go over to the A&R guys. She would say, look, they want me to get rid of my brass section to save money. So they're not gonna get that way, watch this. So she would put her um, vest down slightly with the bra coming up, pull up her skirt a little bit and toss her over to A&R guys, put them on, hi, and da 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 da. And she'll come back and she'll wink at me and go, I've got it, I'm keeping my bras. Yay. I go, do you want your mask bar back? No, no, you keep it, you, you earned that. I said, but you earned it keeping your bras. She was great. So my proudest moment was actually in June 2008. I was playing with George Michael 
And my dream was to have my parents, who divorced in 84, come and see me at Madison Square Garden. Now we did two gigs with George, three gigs at Madison Square Garden with George. But it, it, everything fell into place. The very last gig of the tour was in Fort Lauderdale. And my father lived in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. At the same time, my niece had flown over to Jamaica to see my mum, and they flew over to Fort Lauderdale for the last gig of the tour. So I had my niece, my mum and my dad, and my dad with his new family, which was his, his wife Pauline and her brother, and I think there were three other friends, and there was nine people I had tickets for. And they were all sitting next to each other, but right at the side of the stadium or arena. And so I could see them clearly at, at eye level. And I'm like, I've always wanted to do, to have a gig and have a big gig. And even though it didn't happen in Madison Square Garden, it happened in Fort Lauderdale. But I remember being in the foyer when I was getting the tickets for my parents. And my dad looking around and saying, oh, there's quite a lot of people here, you know. Yeah, there's lots of, <laughs> there's lots of people, very busy. And getting inside and there's 35,000 people in this place. So I'm like, right, you've got, really got to play now. And, and I dug in and dug in, but using the roots of my my literal roots, ancestral roots, and playing from there to kind of go, Dad, you made my first stamp, and you bought me the first guitar, and Mum, you bought me my first bass on the day John Lennon died. Mm. And here we are in 2008, and I'm playing, you're seeing me playing from the 35,000 people with George Michael, so I'm proud. That was like a, <clears throat> Of oh, one, a real <clears throat> so win. Yeah. When I got the call for for Mansell Brown, that was a real big, big thing. And I remember the second gig we did was for Beach Radio One, and we did the gig, and it was literally it was like a one take, one take, and we smashed it. One take, mm. and I remember. Um, I remember doing that and I was so nervous. It was my first time that like, there was no crowd. It's just you and that red dot and you're seeing it. And we call it red fever, mm. red light fever. Mm. And I had red light fever. My hands were shaking. I was sweating. It's funny enough, I had this bass as well with me. And I was like, do you know what? I can do this. And I remember doing it. And I remember at the end, I remember uh, Mansell came up to me afterwards at the end. He said, do you know what? He said, I knew you could play, but I didn't know you could play like that. Mm. And um, so to trot along, a couple of months later, we um, meet my whole family on a Sunday. We come together at my grandma's house. So I've got my aunties, my uncles, my parents, my sister. And we're all around the table. And my sister saw, sees like the, you know on YouTube, you see the, like the picture before the video. And she said, that, that's Evander. So they click on the video and in my grandma's house I've got a nice like big screen TV and the speakers and everything and um, I remember it playing I was so nervous I was shaking my head I said no I don't want to play it don't play it and they played it and I just remember looking at my dad and my dad was so proud he was so proud to see his son do the exact same thing that he did about 30 20, 30 years ago. And it just put smiles on so many people's faces. And I think that is my proudest moment to see your family literally watching you on that screen yeah. and they're absorbing what you're doing because my dad was the person that got me into this, into music, into bass. My dad was a world renowned bass player in his time and especially in the gospel community. He, you know, played in some great venues around the UK and outside. So I've kind of taken on that legacy um, to here. So for him to see that, and that's all I remember him saying is, well done, son. 
and he just shook his head. He's like, well done, son. You've done me proud. So yeah, that is my, my proudest moment playing. <laughs>